In this video, we'll begin our discussion of quadratic comparison sorting algorithms with bubble sort. As the name suggests, on each iteration of bubble sort, we bubble up the largest value in the unsorted integers in our list up to the greatest index. So in our diagrams, we start off with the entire list unsorted in gray, and we put the elements that are considered sorted as red. So you can see on each pass, we have the sorted segment, the red segment growing, and the unsorted segment, the gray segment of the list decreasing. So you can see on our first pass of bubble sort, given our original list, we would bubble up the largest available value, 8, to the largest index in the list. And then on our next pass, we'd bubble up 7, and then we'd bubble up 6, 5, and so forth. So let's look specifically into the details of how we do this now. And bubble sort works by actually swapping adjacent pairs, as we'll see in the code now. Okay, so bubble sort takes as its only argument a vector of integers, and we will discuss how we're using the indices in this implementation. So we initialize i, and i is going to be, so we're going to just, for comments now, i is going to be the largest index in the unsorted list. So when we start off, you'll notice that we initialize i to be the very last position in the list, where we're going to bubble up the largest number. And then you'll notice that our index j is traversing the unsorted list. from the beginning to, to the largest index. Okay, so for each of the largest indices, so i, unsorted index i, we are going to traverse the list from left to right. So that's what j is doing. And it looks at adjacent pairs in the list, and if the element in the list at position j is greater than the element at j plus 1, it swaps them. So it swaps the adjacent pairs. So let's do the first two traces to see this more carefully. So on our very first pass, you can see that i is at the position 5 in the array, and, seven, and j is at initialized to be pointing at 7 at position 0. So I compare 7 and 3, 7 is larger, so I swap them. And then I compare 7 and 8. 7 is not larger than 8, so there's no swap, but now j is pointing at 8. I look at 8 and 6, it, 8 is larger, so I swap them. Then I look at 8 and 5, 8 is larger, so I swap them. And finally, I will compare 8 and 1, 8 is larger, so we swap them. And you'll notice that after the first part, pass of this algorithm, the first iteration, we have 8, which is the largest unsorted element in the largest index that was unsorted. Now, on the next pass, you'll notice that we have i has moved to, toward the front, to the left one. So we have i is now at index 4, and we begin the same. So we compare 3 and 7. 7 is larger, so we swap. So we don't have to do a swap, but j moves over. Now we compare 7 and 6. 7 is larger, so we swap. Then we compare 7 and 5. 7 is larger, so we swap. And then finally, we compare 7 and 1. 7 is larger, so we swap. And you'll notice that now 7 is in the red sorted sub, sub list, and it, it was placed in the largest position in the unsorted array that was gray. And after n minus 2 passes, we will have the entire array sorted. So this is the bubbling up by swapping adjacent pairs on each iteration. So as you can see, the runtime complexity 
of bubble sort is not very good. And the best case complexity is when we have to do no swaps, but you'll notice that we still have to do all of the comparisons. So that's going to be O of n squared, where n is the my list size. So the number of elements on the vector. But we'll notice that the worst case complexity is exactly the same because you just have to swap all of the adjacent pairs, so it would be significantly slower. Okay, now is bubble sort stable? And so we could show that bubble sort is indeed stable. And the line that gives us this is that if statement right there. So we're only swapping through, so we can observe that bubble sort is stable. because we never swap equal values. And because of that line that I highlighted, we would never swap values that were the same, so they would stay in the same order. So that's why bubble sort is indeed stable. Now, we want to consider the concept of loop invariant. So a loop invariant is a predicate k that is true before the loops begin and after each iteration. So now we want to think about what is the loop invariant for the outer loop of bubble sort, for each iteration of bubble sort. So what is true after the kth iteration of bubble sort? So we can think about this before we start, before we do any iterations Let's see what would be true. So all of the elements are unsorted before we have any. So the entire array is gray. So we're calling all the unsorted elements gray, and whatever is sorted is going to be red. So the initial value, so the, both of these statements would be vacuously true for this because we have nothing at index uh, n minus, so zero before any iterations, we'd have nothing uh, sorted. And we can also see that since we have nothing sorted, we can't really make any claims about about anything that is less than. So they're just the arrays and Tyler sorted. So now let's see what ha has happened, what is true after the first iteration. So we're going to say k is equal to one. And it says that all data at indices n minus 1 and above are sorted after the first iteration. So how can we see this? So if you look at the first pass of bubble sort, and here we mean n is equal to my list size, just the size of the list, you'll notice that at index n minus 1, we have the largest value and there's nothing above it so it's sorted whatever's in red is sorted so we can see it on the first pass and now let's see if the second part of the loop invariant it says that all indices below n minus 1 are less than the value at n minus 1 and we can see that this is true because after the first pass we have put the maximum value 8 in the largest index, and you can see that everything that is still gray is less than 8. And we can't say anything more about that, but we, but basically what the loop invariants are saying is that everything at the index n minus k is sorted, and everything at indices less than that are strictly sorted than the smallest sorted, uh, strictly smaller than sorted value, but we can't say if there's an ordering on them precisely. And just let's look at two, if k is equal to two, then we know that everything at index n minus two or greater is sorted. As we can see here, we have seven and eight in red, so they're sorted. And everything that is still gray, so everything at, in, at indices less than n minus two, you can see the entire gray area, it's unsorted and all of the values are strictly less than the sorted portion. So one way to look at these invariants is that we have a sorted portion
So we have the sorted portion in red at the highest indices. And then we have our unsorted portion. And we just know that their values are less than. And it could be equal, possibly, less than the sorted, the smallest sorted value. Okay. And that summarizes bubble sort. Now, why are we concerned about loop invariance? So the reason why we worry about loop invariance is by finding the predicates that are true after each iteration of the loop, we can then use the final iteration to establish the correctness of the entire algorithm. So we just have to make sure that after the total number of iterations that we would have, that the entire list would be sorted. And the way that you can actually prove this formally is that you would prove the predicate by induction and then for the largest value, the largest number of iterations that you would have, you would show that the entire array would have to be sorted.